we're talking, we're here to talk about price elasticity and optimization today. And this is super exciting. Uh, it's actually a new uh, technique that I'm going to be unveiling today with machine learning. Normally in the past, I've done this with like linear regression or GAMS or something like that. Um, but today we're talking about machine learning and I've been floored. We've got a ton of new stuff. Uh, this is really cutting edge um, and I've never done it before and I'm excited to share it with you. This is also one skill that will help you make $150,000 or more in your career. If that's exciting to you, then you are in the right place, my friend. Uh, I am your host, Matt Dancho. This is Learning Lab 88. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what Learning Labs are and um, some of the programming here at the end of the presentation. All right, so let's go. Um, let's see here. Goal for today. I want you guys all walking away with something. So today, my goal for you is I'm going to give you one skill that can make you $150,000 or more in your career. All right. This is a really powerful skill for organizations. Does that sound fair? Let me know in the chat if that sounds exciting to you. All right. All right. Seeing some yeses, yeses, yeses. Okay. Let's do it. Agenda for today. This is an R lab, by the way. Um, so first thing I'm going to cover, why listen to me? Second thing, I'm going to be jumping into a live demo, 300 plus lines of code. And I really put a lot into this. This is all brand new stuff. So if you attended the Python one before, uh, this is completely different than Python. Um, so we're going to be doing new techniques, machine learning, uh, and I have price elasticity and optimization. That is the goal for today. I'm going to show you how to do this for big companies. Uh, conclusion today, how to make $150,000 or more with this skill. And you guys are all leaving here with a free gift. My, my gift to you, what is that? My free gift for making an investment in your education today by staying until the end, you're getting this. It's my ultimate R cheat sheet. I've spent the better part of six years putting this thing together. Uh, here's what it does and why it's important to you. It consolidates the R ecosystem of 20,000 R packages into the 100 best. It saves you years of trying to focus on it breaks learning R packages down by category. And this is really important because when you want to work in spe specific fields, so things like geospatial analysis, network analysis, time series, machine learning, finance, when you want to work in any of these fields, and also if you want to have a superpower and direct you know, things like chat GPT on what packages to use, these are the packages that you need to learn. And I'm going to give you guys this cheat sheet, amazing reference at the end of the presentation today. But you guys got to stick around, all right? Okay, with that said, a little bit of background before. Um, so if you've never been on a, a workshop with me, welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Matt Dancho, and I'm really excited to have you. Uh, my name is Matt Dancho, and this is a little bit about me. Uh, I do love R. It's one of my favorite. It's my favorite um, programming language for data science, and I've been using it for the better part of 10 years now. Uh, and even though we're talking about, you know, a lot of different things, you know, Every, everything comes back to how quick and efficient you can do stuff. And that's one of the reasons that I just, I fell in love with R back in the day. Um, so I want to make sure that you guys know my roots. Uh, I am proud of them. And uh, also, I'm the founder of a company called Business Science. And what I do is I train elite data scientists. And I've had the pleasure of having a lot of successes helping them become great. In fact, I'd like to introduce you to a few uh, these are just a couple of the ones that are helping out with helping me out with my new time series package, uh, Time TK. Uh, we've got Jeff Tackies, Justin Curlin, Samuel Macedo, Lucas Aquadishu, Plamen Rabdariski, and Alex Riggio. So these guys, uh, what's all in common with them? They're helping me with my software, of course, but what else? They're my students. And I have lots of students like these that are becoming elite data scientists, helping to actually build the future of R, of Python, and of the future of data science. So I'm excited about that. My students are all over the world. Uh, some are in Toronto, Canada. Some are in the Netherlands. Some are in New Jersey. And while well, this guy's somewhere in the USA. Uh, but the, fa the fact is, is that Fortune 500 companies, they employ my students. In fact, m most of the Fortune 500 companies employ my students. Uh, and that's what brings us here today, because my goal is to help you grow your career. And I do that with these trainings. My, my job, I want to help you land your next career, your next promotion or advancement. All right. That starts with data science education. All right. So that brings us here today. Today, we're talking about price optimization. We're going to be using machine learning, a new technique. Uh, I, I feel like this is super novel. At least it is to me. Um, and uh, we're going to be doing this in R. 
So these are some of the graphics that we're going to create today. I will explain more about what these mean in a second, but I do have one chart, uh, the chart of the day that I'm going to show you here. It might be a little tough to see because uh, I had to shrink it down to fit it on the screen. But the key here is we're going to be comparing linear regression to XGBoost for this price modeling uh, assessment. So we're going to be optimizing price, checking out the elasticity of price as demand increases or decreases, what happens to prices. And most commonly, companies use good old fashioned linear regression. Problem with that is it's about, it's much less accurate than some of the newer techniques like XGBoost. And you can see that with the dotted lines here and, and such. Um, it's actually not doing a very good job at modeling a lot of these things, especially these dots here, they're way off. Um, whereas XGBoost is much more accurate and we're gonna see that today. All right, so uh, that's a little preview of what's coming. Who's ready for a demo? Put a one in the chat if you guys wanna see a demo. Awesome, 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 awesome. All right, we are good to go then. Here we go. Price optimization. We have a 30 minute demo. We're gonna be talking about iPhone case sales. This is a business case study. And uh, I will explain more about that here in a second. So um, the code for today, uh, let me scroll up here. Um, actually for my Learning Labs Pro members, this is gonna be, a, this is a Learning Lab that you guys are watching. Uh, those who want the code, you guys have to join Learning Labs Pro. What that means is you will get this Learning Lab 88. There's also 87 other Learning Labs that you get, like the price optimization one we just did in Python uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, what you guys are getting today specifically, um, there's a data folder that's going to contain our price optimization CSV file. That's going to be the data on product prices, quantity sold, and a bunch of characteristics about um, the, uh, the sales numbers. Uh, we're going to be working out of the analysis file, which is this 01 price optimization.r file. That's what I have opened up over here. Okay. And we have a full analysis. I mean, this thing is jam packed today. Uh, it is to prove it 314 lines of code, several steps that we're going to go through that kind of walk through my data science process. All right. With that said, uh, we're going to get started here. So price optimization with machine learning and R, the first thing that we have to do, guys, when we're going to be analyzing prices is we've got to have some libraries to be able to do so. So we're going to analyze or we're going to use some of my favorites. Uh, we've got first my data analysis libraries. So we're going to pull in the tidyverse. Uh, we're going to pull in uh, an R package that I've actually developed called correlation funnel. Uh, and we're going to pull in skimmer. Um, those are for data analysis. The next two, um, we're going to pull in Plotly. Um, that's a interactive visualization library. We'll use that in certain spots. And then we're going to pull in my TidyQuant library. Now, this is actually a finance library, but it has this really cool ggplot theme that makes your ggplots just much more professional with just a few lines of code. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're actually going to be working with machine learning and this new package uh, for what's called conformal prediction. Now, put a one in the chat uh, if you've ever heard of conformal prediction before. Have you guys ever heard of that? Have you ever used it before? Put a one in the chat. Okay. All right. Now, put a zero in the chat if you've never heard of conformal prediction before, because this tells me how, how deep we need to go into these concepts. Okay. Lots of zeros. All right. Cool. Well, we'll dive into it once we get to the machine learning part. And I'll really uh, emphasize what uh, advantage this gives us. Um, okay, so uh, we're pulling in tidy models, which is the machine learning. It's kind of like scikit-learn uh, for the for the Python folks. And we're going to use the probably library. And this is a new package that contains a lot of that, um, we'll say, the conformal prediction stuff. It's got a lot of, lot of other stuff in it, but uh, we're going to be using it for conformal prediction. All right, more on that in a minute. Uh, next thing, data import. So we got to import our CSV file that is just in our data folder. So we're just going to pull that in real quick, uh, run that. And what it's doing is we're storing it as price optimization raw tibble. Here's what that looks like. So here's our data set. Uh, it's only 800 lines by four columns. Uh, but let me explain what's in here. We've got a price column. So that's the price. And what we're trying to do is measure what's called price elasticity. So when we change that price, what effect does that have on demand? So our demand is measured by quantity sold. So that's how many quantity, you know, at that particular price point during an average day or on a special event. So over here, you're going to see which products. So there's multiple products in here. Um, like this one, for example, is a standard case for an iPhone 15 Pro Max. There's also some other ones like premium cases and, and whatnot. 
Um, and then the event. So if there was any events where we've measured specific data, so no promo is just like your every day, but then there's some events like Black Friday, Christmas, uh, et cetera. And we'll talk about some of those events here a little bit more in detail. Next, what I normally do in my particular process is I do data examination. So um, I like to use the glimpse function and that's good for wide data sets. So I can get a, kind of a quick synopsis, uh, price, quantity sold, product, event, nothing much new than what I saw up here. But if you have like a really wide data set, um, sometimes it's good to glimpse it. Um, and then what I like to do sometimes is use the skim function. So what skim does is it provides a quick data summary. And this is good when you're not familiar with data. So if you're, if it's the first time you're pulling a data set, say from a SQL database, uh, use the skim function on it because what this does is it'll show you, you know, some information about that. So 800 rows by four columns, two of the rows are character, two of the rows are numeric. Um, right now we don't have any grouping variables because I didn't group by anything. Um, but you can group by, uh, some of these columns that are character here. Uh, we could have grouped by them. Uh, variable type character. So it's going to give us some information. It's going to show us like the number of missing. Okay, this is good. You know, kind of uncommon, but good. You know, we do have no missing data. Uh, completion rate one is 100%. Um, the minimum number uh, for products is uh, there's 28, max is 33. Um, number of unique products is four, and so on. And we've got the same type of information for the events. Um, there's uh, looks like five unique events. Uh, we'll talk more about what those events are. And then we've got the numeric data. Um, so the price, uh, we can see, again, no missing. Same thing with the quantity sold. We get a little mini histogram here, uh, and we can see what the um, average values are and so on. So average value is 400. Average quantity sold is 633. All right. Cool. So just a little bit about my process and how to quickly get some information about this data set. Next. Exploratory data analysis. Some data scientists will skip this stage. Big mistake. So we want to do um, some exploratory data analysis, uh, and we want to do some specific visualizations for this particular problem so you can get a sense for what's happening with this price elasticity. All right. So the first visualization that we have here is just going to be a simple price versus quantity uh, sold. So we're going to do uh, use good old fashioned ggplot, one of my favorite libraries. Um, we're going to do what's called create a scatter plot here. So let me just run this code here uh, and I will show you what this outputs. So what we have here uh, very quickly is the price elasticity. And you can see um, our X is our price. This is the variable that's going to change. And then the dependent variable uh, is going to be demand. So what happens to our demand and our, or our quantity sold as we increase the price for several of these different um, iPhone styles, okay? So, um, and uh, if we want to, what we can do is actually, if I store this as G and then do ggplotly G, uh, this will make it interactive, okay? Um, and the reason that it's sometimes good with interactive is you can actually like turn some of these on and off and so on. So we can actually see, you know, like what's going on in here. Now, I'm not sure why these aren't turning off for me, but um, uh, yeah, we can we can just take that smoother off for you now. Control Shift C, rerun that, and uh, we can kind of we can kind of see the the prices of these products. All right. So the important thing to recognize here is we've got a premium case for iPhone 15 Pro, a premium case for iPhone 15 Pro Max, standard case iPhone 15 Pro, standard case iPhone 15 Pro Max. So four different products that we're analyzing. Uh, these are the price points uh, right here uh, on the X, on the Y is our demand. And we're gonna see that there's some weird stuff going on. So some outliers up here. Uh, we're gonna wanna try and understand what those outliers are in a little bit. Um, okay, uh, one of the questions I got leading up to this lab uh, that, that one of my students actually brought up last, or when I did the Python version is, what about log log transformation? And I wanna show you what happens uh, when we do log log transformation. And this is one of the reasons that I prefer not to transform the data set if I don't have to. Um, so all I'm doing here is this is the same code as this up here. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm putting a log price here and a log quantity sold. So that's, a, that's doing what's called a log log transformation. Now, how many of you guys have done demand, um, 
price elasticity and demand modeling before and done a log log transformation. Put a one in the chat. Okay. All right. So lot, lots of people. All right. Well, this, this is what happens with, with this particular data set. And um, it's not necessarily, so what you're trying to do is get kind of more of a linear relationship. Uh, and also what it's doing is suppressing some of these outliers, which for linear regression, that can be good. But in this specific instance, those outliers are actually going to be very important because they're going to be tied to events. We'll see that here in a little bit. Um, you can see some of these get a good relationship, like a straight line here, but some of these still are pretty curved. Um, this one particularly. This one's a kind of a straighter line, which is which is good. Uh, but again, some of these outliers are going to be very important. And what, what happens is we're actually suppressing it. So that's why we're not going to be uh, doing a log log. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use a modeling technique called machine learning. We're going to use a, an algorithm called XGBoost here in a little bit to be able to model these prices um, because that's a nonlinear algorithm. We're just going to do a really good job. All right. Uh, next thing. What I like to do is uh, I like to do this thing called um, the correlation funnel. And this is a package that I wrote that does this. I, I think I might have been the person who came up with this. I've never heard it called a correlation funnel before. Um, but the, uh, the idea here is we're going to do a correlation analysis. We're going to take our raw data. And what I want to know is, remember, quantity sold is what we're trying to predict. Um, that's what we're trying to analyze, at least. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what's called a binarization process. This is just uh, for numeric data. What we're going to do is we're going to bin it. Um, so all the all these numeric features here, price and quantity sold, they get binned into various um, kind of uh, quantiles or so. So they're going to do four different quantiles per, per numeric feature. Um, the first one's going to be the lower price. So if it falls into the lower price category, it's a one. Otherwise, it gets a zero. Um, and, the, and then for the uh, categorical data, uh, what it's going to do is it's going to be split out into um, basically what's through a process called one-hot encoding. It's going to, um, again, get binary features. So that's why I call it binarization. All these features have ones and zeros. And uh, if we do glimpse here, uh, we can actually see that effect a little bit better. So let's do the glimpse. And you can see now we've got that binarization process. The numeric features got binned and then these got one hot encoded, all right? All right, so uh, this is actually cool because we can see there's so several events in here like Black Friday, Christmas, uh, a new, when a new iPhone model gets introduced, whether there's, there's no promotion uh, and then the big game, uh, that's AKA the Super Bowl. Um, okay, so that's what we've got going on here. And what I wanna do is I wanna correlate um, all of these features here uh, against one of these quantities. So I'm going to pick the highest quantity sold. So if it falls, if um, one of the lines in our data set, uh, one of the rows falls into that highest product or highest quantity sold, then what we're going to do is we're going to create a correlation. So if we correlate all these features, we get um, here, might need to, yeah, quantity sold, this one. Okay, try that one more time. Oh, I see. I got the glimpse in here. I got to take that out. So let's do this. Control enter. And now we've got our correlation analysis done. But the funnel is the, is the best part because what this does is it actually um, takes this correlated data and puts it into this, this funnel looking. And why I call it a funnel is because the widest are at the top. So we've got our uh, quantity sold, which is what we're uh, trying to analyze. And we can see quantity sold has a perfect correlation with why I sold when it's 934. Um, and, and you can see that there's a negative correlation with these other quantity sold buckets, uh, which is what we would expect. Now, so what I want to know is what's correlated with higher quantity sold. Well, we can see standard iPhone case uh, is, you know, positively correlated. Uh, this premium case is, is also positively correlated, but this standard case and this premium case are negatively correlated. So you're not going to sell as many, like these are your, your uh, probably not your core products, uh, potentially. Uh, also price, we're seeing that lower price products tend to be sold more. So you see negative infinity to $24 uh, are highly correlated with 934 units to infinity units. Okay. Um, also events, uh, things like Black Friday and Christmas are positively correlated with higher units sold. 
Uh, conversely, no promo. And if a new iPhone model comes out, so you make cases for an iPhone model and a new iPhone like iPhone 16 comes out, that has a negative impact on your um, on your quantity sold. So already I'm starting to get some good information. I'm really starting to understand this data set. Um, and that brings me to my next point is sometimes what we want to do is we want to do outlier analysis. So we're going to take a look at some of these events in here. Okay. So the next step here that I'm going to do is I'm going to make another ggplot visualization. Um, and this is the last part of my exploratory analysis, but I really want to understand what the, um, what's going on with, with some of these events. So all I'm doing here is I'm going to color by event. So let me run this code here and I'll show you what happens. Um, so we're making an interactive plot. Okay. Uh, it looks a little crazy. I got all these lines on here, but what I'm doing is I'm coloring by event here. So this event like Black Friday, Christmas, new iPhone, no promo. And what we can do is we can start to see the effect that some of these events have on the particular prices. So let me just take off a few of these. So let me take out new iPhone and the big game. And what I'm going to do here is just compare Black Friday to kind of like your everyday price. So it looks like Black Friday, that has a positive Im impact. And especially if we, like for this premium iPhone case, if we reduce the price on Black Friday, we can sell potentially a lot more units. You're seeing some of these outliers here are because of that Black Friday event, all right? And if I take that Black Friday off, you can see now this data kind of looks a lot less, you know, a lot, lot fewer outliers. Um, conversely, if we do the new iPhone, so if you remember from the plot over here, we saw that new iPhones negative, negatively correlated with quantity sold. So if I go back here uh, and put new iPhone up here, we can see, yep, up oh, new uh, iPhone generally drops the demand quite quite a bit, even for the uh, for the same given price. So. If this was priced premium case at fifty dollars, uh, normally without a new iPhone model, we'd sell, say, eight hundred and thirty-three units a day. Now we're down to like three hundred and ninety, so less than half. Okay, so that's the effect here, uh, and it affects each model differently. Um, some some models have a much drastic, like steeper decline. So this is more price elastic or more price sensitive. Um, some of these it might have special features or something about it. Uh, it's less price sensitive. Like for the standard case, iPhone 15, uh, and the, in this pre, uh, premium case, iPhone 15 Pro model. Um, so maybe the max is is more for whatever reason, um, you know, more uh, more susceptible to to the pricing. Um, okay, so that's a little bit about this data, and that's just I wanted to sh to give you that context because it's really important to understand what the business is going through when um, when we when we're setting these prices you know the events matter a lot those are you know the outliers the uh, the event analysis and generally speaking though as we increase prices the quantity of units tends to go down um, some of it may be linear some this one does not look linear it seems to be like steeper at first and then kind of go to linear uh, and so on um, so we want to be able to model that. But before we model that, um, I'm going to add a few different features in here. And this will just help me keep track of some stuff. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add in a, a, a new column called is event. And what that's going to do is it's just going to tell me whether or not there's an um, whether or not there's no promotion or if there's some event going on. Um, the other one I'm going to add in is revenue um, because this is something I do want to track. I want to know what my revenue is. And then the last one is the row ID. So I'm adding a row ID column just to keep track of all the rows, uh, the revenue, which is just my price times my quantity sold, um, and the uh, is event. Now, I'm not going to util utilize all of these, but I think um, it's important to have these features in my data set as I go through my analysis. Okay. All right. So we're going to save this as price optimization uh, prep tibble. And now we're gonna move into machine learning with XGBoost. And I'm going to be going through this process now where we compare linear regression to XGBoost. Um, show of hands here, who has used, uh, who has used linear regression before for uh, price optimization? I did a survey on LinkedIn and it looked like about 40% of people who um, use linear regression. Uh, it also, you know, I was surprised. A lot of people are also using things like machine learning, but um, it 
you know, it did seem like a lot of people are using linear regression. And that's what I used to use. I mean, that when I did this stuff previously, that's what I would do. I would use, you know, good, good old fashioned linear regression uh, in R. <laughs> okay. All right. So, and some people have also used things like, uh, looks like Mary Beth has used Van Western Dorp model. I've never heard of that before. I'll be honest. Um, <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. Uh, sounds weird. <laughs> All right. So, I want to show you the machine learning and I want to compare that to linear regression. I want to show you some of the pros and cons. So um, the first thing I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to do what I always do, which is create a training and testing split. And what this is going to do is uh, basically take this price optimization tibble, uh, which is 800 rows. And we're going to split it up into one data set of 640 rows. That's going to be my training data set. And then a, another data set of 160 rows, which is my testing data set. Okay. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and uh, come up with a, uh, a pre-processing strategy for my linear regression model. And I'm going to, I'll explain kind of what I'm doing uh, here in just a second. So let me, let me run through this real quick. Um, so this is what that, pre-processing strategy is going to do. So anytime you, you develop a machine learning model, you normally want to pre-process the data to get it in the right format. So your linear regression will work on it. Um, and what I'm doing here is I'm removing row ID and revenue. So we don't have, uh, we still have is event in here. Um, our predictor is going to be quantity sold. Uh, I'm removing any features that may have zero variance because if it doesn't have any variation, then those features are unimportant. Um, then what I'm doing is I'm dummying for one hot encoding. Um, so in this instance, what I'm doing is dummying. Uh, I have one hot false. And that's because if you do one hot true, um, you, uh, you can run into issues with multicollinearity and those sorts of things. Um, and then the last thing I'm doing, and this is, this is a little different. So a lot of people probably don't do this, but because some of these prices are non-linear and I can tell that, um, let me see if I take a look at uh, one of the previous plots here. So yeah, you can see how this is curved here. What I'm doing is I'm adding in a spline uh, and this is BS, step BS for a basis spline on the prices. And what I'm trying to do, and it's gonna create these three basis spline features, and what I want to try and do is capture some of that non-linearity. Um, so that way the linear regression ideally predicts a little bit better. All right. Um, so that's what I'm doing here uh, with this first recipe. I'm storing it as recipe L LM, and we will use this when we create our linear regression model. All right. Next thing, um, I'm going to create a separate reci recipe for XG boost. Why? Well, we don't need to add splines in for uh, XG boost. It, it's already a non-linear algorithm. Um, and, uh, what I'm going to do, there's a little bit, um, one other change here. We're going to set one hot equal to true. Uh, this makes it more explainable. And it also, um, gives me, uh, and, and, and XG boost works fine with one hot encoded predictors. Um, okay. So this is what the recipe XG boost, um, when you apply that recipe, it looks something like this. We've got price is event quantity sold. These have all been one hot encoded. So the difference between, anybody know the difference between one hot encoding and dummy encoding? All right, I'll answer it. Yeah, dummy leaves one out, exactly. So we only have three um, features here for the recipe LM. You see this uh, leaves one out. So there's a premium case uh, for iPhone 15 Pro that is left out. Uh, conversely, when we do one hot encoding down here, for the XG boost. So this is recipe XGB. You're going to get all four of those features in there. And that's why I say it's more explainable because it has all of the features in there that I need to be able to make my assessments. I don't have to remember like which one was left out. Um, same, same thing here for the events. Um, all five events are in here versus only four are in here for the uh, linear regression. Okay. All right. Good. So now that we get that, um, the next thing we want to do is we want to create this linear regression model. And we're going to use tidy models. Uh, and what it, what we do is we create first an empty workflow um, where we have to add a preprocessor and a model. So every, every workflow has always a machine learning model and a preprocessor. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add to it a model. Um, and this is just a specification. I haven't actually like trained anything. I'm just telling that workflow that I want to use a linear regression model when I go to train the model, all right? So that's all I'm doing. It's, it's a specification. 
Um, we're going to set, we're going to use linear regression, um, set the mode to regression and set the engine to LM. That's going to use the LM function from the stats package in R. Okay. Um, and then we're going to add our recipe. So that's the preprocessor. So we still have preprocessor none. We just have to add that. And that's what we do right here. So now we're going to have a preprocessor in here with the four recipe steps. And with that, we're actually ready to train our machine learning model. So I'm going to train it on the splits. Um, so training splits, this is going to give me my 640 uh, rows. So this is going to be our my training data. And I'm going to store this as workflow LM. And I put underscore fit here because, because we are actually fitting it or training it. Okay. Um, once we have that done, we now have our fitted linear regression model, and you can see some of the output here, some of the coefficients, uh, and whatnot. And you can see, you know, uh, we, we could analyze these for effects and, and those sorts of things. Um, but, uh, the next thing I want to do is I want to show you guys how to do, how to replicate this for XG boost now. All right. So again, what we want to do is we want to use XGBoost because this may help improve the accuracy when we go to actually model these prices, all right? Um, so we're going to use the same process, same thing, workflow, workflow. Uh, this time when we add a model, we're going to swap linear regression out for this thing called boost tree, and we're going to set the engine to the XGBoost. So what, the, what that's going to do, it's going to use the XGBoost package, all right? When I run this, these two lines, this creates a new workflow with a boost tree as the model specification. And then we're going to add the recipe XG boost. So just make sure you swap out. You don't use the recipe LM. So when we do that, we now have the three-step uh, recipes. And then we're ready to fit. So just the same type of process. We're going to store this as workflow XG boost fitted. Um, you'll notice that the output is different for this one. We can see there's an XG booster in here. Okay. All right, with that said, um, take, a, take a quick sip of my drink. Now what I wanna do in uh, my outline here is I wanna talk about performance. So we now have these two, um, these two modeling approaches ready, ready to, to rock and roll, but there's some pros and cons to each. Um, and I wanna talk about that when it comes to performance. So um, normally machine learning is gonna be more accurate but one of the downsides is, is that uh, we can, when we do linear regression, we can, we can get things like confidence intervals pretty quickly. Um, and I'll, and I'll, I'll talk more about the, the approach to confidence intervals and why, I, and you may agree with it. You may disagree with it. I disagree with how uh, the confidence intervals are produced for linear regression models. Um, but, and I'll, and I'll explain why here in a second. Um, but that's one of the benefits with going with a linear approach is you get things like coefficients right away. You can see the effect of each of your coefficients. If it's positive, that means it's, you know, it's going to have a positive effect on quantity sold, much like the correlation analysis that we did. Um, you don't get that with XGBoost, but, but there's ways around that. Um, and I'm going to show you one of the ways, uh, specifically for the, um, getting the, the quantiles or the, the, the confidence, right? So remember how I said, you know, XGBoost just gives you a point estimate. It doesn't give you any confidence. I'm going to show you today how to get that confidence. This is pretty fantastic. It's, it's like brand new stuff. Um, so first let's talk about linear regression. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a prediction. I'm just using this predict function and notice I'm using test splits now. So this is our, the test splits is just our 160 that were held out from the training process. You always want to do predictions on your test set when you're analyzing accuracy. So that's what we're going to do here. Um, now, the difference is, oh, and if you get this warning, and this is one of the issues that you can run into with um, linear regression, is you uh, sometimes will run into this problem with rank deficient fits. Uh, that just means your data set's getting very wide, um, meaning lots of columns to it, and your linear regression can overfit. So it's giving you a warning. And that's one of the problems with linear regression. But it's made some predictions for me now. So I now have the predictions that I need for all 160 of these, uh, um, uh, all, all 160 of these rows here. Okay. So I'm predicting the quantity sold. Like for example, this, this quantity sold up here was 1200 units and I can see it's predicting 1,132 on the out of sample data set. All right. Next thing, like I said, you can get just from that uh, linear regression model, the confidence interval. 
Um, you use the same predict function. And what you can do is you can set type equal to conf underscore int, and you can do level equals 0 0.95 and watch what this does. When I run this, this gives me dot pred lower dot pred upper. Now, look how tight these are. Uh, 1109 to 1155. Well, if that's a 95% confidence interval and this is 1208, there's no way that's a true 95% confidence interval, right? So this is one of my problems with linear regression is it tricks you into thinking, oh, if I do this confidence interval, you know, 0 0.95, and a lot of people call it, like think it's a prediction interval or whatever. I don't use this. Um, what I always do is I want to estimate what that, um, what that level should be on out of sample data. And unfortunately by default, linear regression uses in sample data to measure the level, all right? Because it doesn't know what your out of sample data looks like, all right? So that's one of the things I disagree with. So let's talk about XGBoost. Now, one of the situations with XGBoost is if I try to run the same type of thing here where I take my workflow XGB fit now instead of workflow LM fit and run it through this line here. Um, if I try and do that, I'm gonna get an error, okay? And it says here, no confidence interval prediction method available for this model. So that, that's because XGBoost, you don't by default get a confidence interval. So you can't do like quantile regression with XGBoost. Um, actually, I do think they are coming out with quantile regression, but there's a solution. And that's where this thing called conformal prediction comes into play. Now, as I had mentioned previously, it sounds like most of you have never heard of conformal prediction before. So I'll try and explain it the best way that I can. Um, there's a bunch of different methods out there that you can use for conformal prediction. Uh, and what we're, what our goal is, is, uh, for a regression problem is to estimate the confidence around our predictions. Okay. So, um, like I said, there's a bunch of different methods. You can use, you know, different algorithms. We're going to use the easiest and the fastest one. It may not be the best one, but I like it. Um, it's, it's a pretty straightforward calculation. It's called the conformal split method. So conformal split. Um, we're going to use this function from probably, and what, and all you do, it's very simple. You just take your uh, workflow that you've created previously that you fit, and then you pipe it, you use this, this command right here, and you pipe it into int conformal split, and you give it the out of sample data. Okay. So when I do that, what this is doing is it's going to create this object called a split conformal inference object. All right. Um, and then it's telling you to use predict with new data and level to compute prediction in intervals. So let's try this. Um, and I'm going to store this as a new object called workflow XGB conformal. All right. Um, and I'll, and I'll actually, I'll dive into a little bit more because this is fascinating how they do this. Um, but let's, let's just use it real quick. Uh, so I've got this conformal object that I've now created. And like it said down here, use predict object, new data level. So this is my object. My new data is going to be my testing splits. And I just give it my level. And just like this, we now have prediction, but I also have my 95%. So it's predicting here for this first one, 1,063, but my lower is going to be 877 and my upper is 1250. All right. And if I go back up here and I see the actual value for this first one is 1208, that's within the boundaries. And that's what's really cool about the conformal predictions is it's actually giving you true 95% confidence intervals. All right. Um, and then the last step here, uh, what I'm doing is I'm going to rename each one of these columns. So I'm going to, um, so if we saw here before it was dot pred upper, um, cause I'm going to do the same process for linear regression. So I'm going to append, uh, underscore XGB to each one of these columns, just like that. And I'm going to store it as pred XGB conformal. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to, because I don't like the, how linear regression does confidence intervals. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same thing. So we're, we have an apples to apples comparison between linear regression and XGBoost. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to run the in conformal split. Um, I'm going to predict with level 95 uh, and I'm going to rename and I'm just going to put underscore LM and I'm going to save these as pred LM conformal. All right. So let's save this and we can see that now 844 and the upper bound is 1379 now. So that 12, 
05 or whatever it was is now within the boundary. So lower level is 1132, upper level is 1379. Okay. That's is that pretty fantastic? Do you guys do you guys see like how important that is? We can we now have you know, essentially confidence intervals, true confidence intervals that we can get out of these black box models and linear regression models that are more, um, that are, that are more appropriate. Okay. All right. Um, next we'll move on to accuracy. So we want to assess which model we want to use for our price elasticity modeling. Okay. So we haven't actually done like any price elasticity modeling, uh, quite yet. I mean, we've created the fitted models, so what we want to do is um, I'm going to take my testing splits and I'm going to calculate the accuracy to show you the benefit here. So testing split is my 160 out of sample. Um, I'm going to select the row ID, which just grabs my first row, my, my row IDs. Then I'm going to bind columns with the prediction LM conformal. So these are my predictions, uh, the, predict, the, the point prediction, and then the range, the, the lower and upper for both the linear regression and for the XG boost. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bind it again with the actual data so that this has the price in here and it's also got the other features in here as well. I'm going to save this as my predictions test tibble because it's predictions on the test set. Uh, we can glimpse that real quick to show you what I've got in here. Um, now I've got all of the predictions and the ranges of those predictions. And um, I have the actual value for quantities sold right here. So I can compare these now and I can get my accuracy metrics. Um, what I'm going to do first is just analyze uh, the, the pred LM versus quantity sold. I want to see what my error is. So what I see here is a uh, mean absolute error of 98.4. What that means is when a prediction is made for each one of these, on average, we're off about by 100 units, which which is kind of a lot. I mean, if a point prediction is 1,000, you know, on average, you're, you're off plus or minus 100 units. Uh, and that can be you know, it's obviously a cost uh, because if you're off by that far, then um, your model really isn't that accurate. So if we run the same code again for the metrics and with XG boost, we can see on average, we're only off now by 65 units. So that is literally 65.5 divided by uh, uh, 98.4. Yeah, so we're we're literally uh thirty-three percent more accurate with with the XG boost model. Okay. And that's what I'm showing here. Um I'm just showing it with the RMSE here. Um so the same thing for the root mean squared error. Uh we're we're thirty-three percent more accurate with root mean squared error. 30, 33 as well with uh, mean absolute error. Pro tip guys, don't just trust your accuracy, you don't just trust the point estimate, but actually visualize what that accuracy looks like. So this is, um, we're going to, we're going to do two quick plots here, um, two interactive plots. This one is going to show you the accuracy with, um, linear regression versus XG boost. Um, you can see here that if I just take a look at the linear regression, okay. So the, this is the actual point and the prediction that is related to that actual point. And you can see we're off substantially here, okay? Um, so what happens when I use XG boost though, is that these predictions are so much more accurate. I mean, they're much, much closer. Like this one, for example, actually follows the shape of, of this demand profile. Um, same thing here, like, like literally these, this point here is almost dead nuts on. Um, so that's the advantage here, uh, why, uh, linear regression is, is uh, in my opinion, not the best approach, especially when you're concerned with accuracy. Okay. Um, the next one here, let's see. Oh, this is another way to visualize now the confidence intervals. So what this code here is doing is it's now, instead of looking at um, the point predictions, what we're doing is we're plotting the prediction lower and, and, and upper intervals. And what I want to show you here is that XG boost, which is the blue, it's um, it, it's not as wide so as the linear regression. So that means it's more accurate. Again, this is kind of like showcasing that 60, you know, 66, we're off by 66 on average versus uh, uh, 100 units on average, okay? So all this means to the bottom line is, is that uh, your, your model is gonna be more accurate and that's what companies uh, typically want.
All right. Okay. So now that we have a model that we're excited about, this XG Boost model, what I want to do is I want to go through um, our what what's called our optimization. So we now have a model that knows how how the prices vary. It's fairly accurate. It's only off by 66 units per um, on, on average. So what we want to do is then take that model um, I'm, and I'm going to retrain it on the full data set. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to run my optimization, basically a simulation. I'm going to simulate uh, for a bunch of different prices. Uh, I'm going to try and figure out where the, the optimal point is to uh, to be able to um, give back give that back to my company. So that's the business insight. So um, there, the one thing um, that is a little weird about these conformal predictions is if you look inside of this, this conformal predictor. So um, I need to retrain it, but I don't want to lose the conformal prediction part of it. So it's got the workflow embedded in here. Well, it turns out uh, what I need to do is I need to retrain that workflow. So I'm going to set this, this workflow object in here. Um, I'm going to set that equal now to, and I'm going to fit it on the entire data set. So instead of just 640 data points, I'm going to train it on all, all 800. Okay. So that's what I'm doing here. And that's what you see. Okay. All right. Once we have it retrained, I can do what's called a simulation. So what I can do is I can take my price optimization prepared tibble. Uh, that's this data set here, 800. I can group it by product and event. Okay. And then I can run summarize and I can summarize the min and the max price. And when I do that, I now have the price min and the price max. And what I want to do is I want to create a sequence of prices to, to calculate and then iteratively calculate all, or not iteratively, but calculate all the, um, the predictions for those. So I'm going to, I'm going to create this price min max tibble, which is this, this up here. It's only 20 by four. And then I'm going to do this cool thing. Um, so I can use this function called PMAP. And what this is going to do is it's going to create a, se a sequence between the lower and the upper bound of length 200. So it's basically going to give me 200 price points uh, in between this lower and upper bound. So when I run that, look something like this. I now have 200 price points between 40.6 and 89.4. Uh, I now have two, 200 price points between 45.9 and 85. And then um, I'm going to deselect because I no longer need the price min max. And then I'm going to do this thing called unnesting. So what that'll do is it'll expand out all the price points. I now have 4,000 different prices in my simulation. Um, I'm going to just quickly add row ID to column. And then um, because we're, we have to have the same columns in here, I'm going to add some, uh, some kind of like some dummy features like is event. I'm going to have is event in there. Uh, and the, uh, revenue equals NA. Um, otherwise, you won't be able to run your machine learning model because it needs to have those columns in there. It doesn't actually use those for any predictions. So I've got my my dummy columns in here, is event and revenue, all right? Okay, um, with that said, now we're going to take that workflow XGB conformal that's been retrained on the full data set. We're gonna predict on our simulation with a level of 95 percentile. It gives me the, the predictions. I'm going to rename all underscore XG boost. I'm going to bind it with the simulation. And then I'm going to add some columns for revenue predicted XG boost, uh, which is just going to be our quantity sold, which is going to be our prediction times price. And then the lower and the upper boundary is going to be our quantity sold lower prediction and our quantity sold upper prediction times the price. All right. We'll save this as revenue predictions. And now we have the simulated data. And the last step, let's let's visualize it. See what it looks like. Now, what I've done is I've just filtered when there is no event going on. Um, so I'm actually modeling these. Now, one thing I will show you, and this is a downside of using a tree-based model um, for your uh for your values here, you're gonna see kind of um like the it's, it's kind of jagged. It's not like a smooth line. So we actually have to add a smoother to it um, in, in the visual. But what's cool is we also have the conformal region and you can see what your worst case scenario is and your best case scenario is. Um, same thing here uh, in each of these different price profiles. 
Um, we can do the same thing for when event is one. So this would be things like Black Friday or when that new iPhone model comes out. So let's check out what that looks like. Uh, here's the different uh, visualization. And you can see for Black Friday, we've got this profile um, for this particular model. For Christmas, uh, it looks like this. For a new iPhone, it drops down substantially. Um, and then the big game, you know, it's not, it's kind of similar to Christmas. Um, but Black Friday is probably the highest price. Um, same thing here for this particular model and so on. So you can go down through all of your models and you now have your uh, revenue optimizations. So again, this is revenue on the side here. And what we're looking for is where that revenue is maximized. The, the blue line is what I'm actually most interested in. So how do we add that blue line to our data? Remember, we've got this revenue prediction table here. Um, which is just, uh, like if I look at this revenue predicted this 271 or 20, 27,154, we want to try and maximize this. But if, if you remember back here, that maximization is so jaggedy, what we want to do is we want to add a smoother to it. Okay. So here's how to add a smoother. The, uh, the cool thing is, is we can take, we can just select the data that we need our revenue predicted, which is all of these dots here that are all jaggedy. Uh, we can group by product and event, okay? Then we can do what's called nesting. So when we nest, what this does is it takes that um, revenue predicted in price and it puts it into this kind of data structure where like you've got a tibble 200 by two. So it's basically kind of putting that in, into a cell. This is a spreadsheet. This is a cell in my spreadsheet that's going to have a data frame inside of that, that cell. And then what I can do is I can do this thing called mapping. And I can map a low S smoother to uh, this data here that's contained in the cell. And this is really cool. So now, and I'm going to, I'm going to save the predictions. So I now have 200 pr predictions, which is my smooth data. And then if I just un, un, uh, unnest it, I now have all of my smooth predictions. And you can see here that these are now um, like for, for down here, it's a, it's a lot lower or not a lot lower, but like, you know, you see what I'm saying? This is, these are smooth values that actually like, you know, vary with the central tendency of our predictions. Um, and then what we can do is we can just filter to the max of that smoothed. Um, so this, these are the maxes. And then I'm going to slice head uh, uh, one, which is going to make sure I just have the first smooth value that's maximized. And these are where the, the maximum, uh, the, the maxes occur. And then you just ungroup it. And the, the important point here is now I can take this, I can just export this into a Excel spreadsheet and send this to my boss because what this is going to do is it's going to tell us, okay, when it's Black Friday, so say Black Friday is going on right around the corner, right guys, uh, in just like two or three weeks, uh, price point. We need for this iPhone 15, it's, a, it's saying we should go for $40.60, all right? Versus if we're at no promo, $54 and, and 60 cents. So we should drop this price by like, you know, 30%, we'll say. Um, and that should uh, grow our revenue from 15,000 to 25,000 per day for that particular model. Okay. You see how providing that information might be important to your boss. Um, and on a normal day though, we should price it at $54 to maximize revenue at about $15,000 uh, per day for that particular model. Okay. Um, same thing with Christmas and the beauty of it is say your company has many more regressors that are many more things that, um, your company, you know, may affect the prices you can just with machine learning, you can keep adding these in as more, more and more columns. So we just have this event column, but you could add other, you know, other columns in there as well you know, things like date features or things like, you know, maybe Mondays are higher sales than say Saturdays or Sundays. Okay. So you can add those in here um, and so on. All right. So that's pretty cool. Um, hopefully you enjoyed that. That's, that's the real power of this is being able to give your business those insights. And that's, what's really exciting. You know, if you're out there going for a job interview and you'd be able to show them this type of project, this is going to be something that means something to them. Now, I do have some conclusions for you guys though. You now have some tools to optimize prices for your current or your future company, wink, wink, you know, job portfolio, wink, wink. This is a good, good project for that. 
<laughs> but my question to you, is that going to make you $150,000 or more? Let me know in chat. What do you guys think? Is what I just showed you going to make you $150,000? All right. Kanoa says no. David says no. You guys are right. The answer is no. That's not going to make you $150,000. But what will earn you $150,000 per year or more, and what companies are willing to pay you for, is your data science process. Okay? Companies value your process more than they do, you know, just one example of your work. All right? So, and that's okay, because many of you guys might, might be thinking, well, I don't have a data science process. Well, if you don't have one, I'm going to, don't worry, guys. I'm going to give you mine right now. So, oh, and... uh Remember, guys, it, I, at the beginning of the presentation, I told you to get to bring your notepads, pull them out, you know, start start jotting your notes down, um, get, get your pen and your paper handy. Now's the time to take notes. So this is what my data science process looks like, guys. And this is the same process that I that I run like literally 99 percent of my data science projects through. OK, step one, it starts with data science or data collection. All right. Step two, data exploration. Step three, cleaning the data. Step four, pre-processing that data. That gets it ready for machine learning. Step five, run machine learning models on it. Do, do your modeling. Step six, we didn't see this today, but cross-validation. Cross Make sure you pick the right model for the job. Model selection, step seven. And then once you have a model, this is what companies actually want. They want a web application. They want something that you can take into production for them that's going to allow they're business people to make better business decisions. You see, they don't want to have to come to you every time for that, you know, report of, of how to price their products. No, you, sh you should just be able to produce something that they can use, a tool, right? And, uh, oh, this is a bummer. My little GIF here didn't, uh, didn't, didn't work out so well. This is, this is supposed to be an example of my, uh, <laughs> it says image could not be loaded. Why is that? Yeah. Oh, that's a bummer. Yeah, this is a, a gif here of one of my um uh one one of my my coolest um uh shiny apps that uh you know that it, it's an example of what companies actually want you to do now the problem is don't worry guys i got some more shiny apps i'll, I'll show you some shiny apps later but uh the problem is is that probably two percent of you guys on this call today can actually do this, you know, give companies what they're, what they will pay you $150,000 or more for. Now, at the beginning of this presentation, I told you guys all that you leave here with everything you need to make $150,000 or more in your career. Well, most of you thought that was this, you know, fancy price optimization. And while that's important, you know, that's going to help them with one project, but you're going to have a lot more projects than that in your career. So it wasn't actually that. So if you would like to be able to dominate your data science career with R and get a six-figure data science career, I have a special offer for you guys today. Let me know if you would like to see it. Please let me know in chat. Put a one in chat if you guys would like to see the offer that I prepared for you. Okay, good, good, good. Seeing lots of ones, I will continue. All right, pop quiz, guys. What's the shortest... Uh, path between two points. Let me know in chat. What is the shortest path between two points? Anybody? Straight line. Okay. Edward wins. Uh, he's the first. So straight line. It is in fact a line. Now, when people go to learn data science, what they do is they suffer from this thing called shiny object syndrome. And because of this thing called shiny object syndrome, it actually took me five years to become confident in data science. True story. Uh, now, has anyone else caught themselves with SOS. Uh, drop a yes in chat if, if you've had shiny object syndrome where you get distracted a lot. I Hey, I'm right there with you. I'm right there. Okay, lots of yeses, lots of yeses. All right, so uh, tell me, which path do you think you're on right now? Do you think it's path one or path two? Put a, put a one or a two in chat. <laughs> I want to see. All right, I was on path two. It took me five years, so... All right, one and a half. Somebody, some people think they're you know probably a little more optimistic. I would venture to guess probably most of you are, are twos. 1.6. Wow, that's very, you know, that's that's very specific. Three. <laughs> Hernandez on that three. His path is way over. His path uh off of this, off the charts. All right. 
Now, I see everyone else doing the same thing. And to combat this, I've created something that I've cleverly named the path. All right, so here's what the path does. It does two things. First, it shows you what to do for any data science project. And second, it also shows you what skills you need to learn to get the job, all right? It's the single biggest secret to my success as a data scientist, as a teacher, a coach, and as a consultant. Now, here's how it goes. Before you can solve any problems, you need a foundation in data science, and this should be obvious. So we uh, we start the path with some foundational skills in R. What are those foundational skills? Well, it's obviously all of these things like data cleaning, wrangling, visualization, exploratory data analysis, machine learning, clustering, reporting, and programming. You need to be able to do those things as your baseline before you can actually help the company. Now, after that, what you need is this thing called business problem solving. And that is really what companies pay you the big bucks for. So you've got to be able to do things like you saw today, correlation analysis. Uh, you didn't see this today, but how to cost a problem, how to pre-process the data, how to tell a story for management, how to do automated machine learning so you're highly productive, how to do explainable AI. You know, as I mentioned, uh, now nowadays, every executive is unsure or they're weary of your models. So you have to be able to explain them to them in, in layman's terms. And you also have to be able to do things like sensitivity analysis. That's like when your executive says, hey, Matt, great presentation, love the predictions, but what happens when we change this like little knob? What happens to your machine learning model then? So you gotta be able to do that. Um, the third thing on the path is if you work for any company that sells anything, they're gonna be, they're gonna ask you to do time series forecasting, all right? So what is time series forecasting? Well, every company you know that sells anything, uh, they're gonna do some form of selling, all right? That means that if you can predict things like sales, revenue, uh, revenue drops, supply and demand, et cetera, um, how valuable do you think you're gonna become when you can do those things that nobody else in your company can do very accurately, right? See, being able to predict the future accurately is one of the most profitable skills that a data scientist can possess. But if you screw it up, you will feel the repercussions. Trust me, I know I've screwed it up before. I've also gotten a lot better at it. Um, so, uh, and then the fourth thing, um, next is building tools for yourself. So building tools for yourself. Ah, oh, my GIF actually worked. Okay, so we've got a, this is what's called a shiny web app. I meant to show you one of these earlier, but apparently my GIF didn't work. Um, and why, does, why is this important? Well, this is what we call production. And building tools for yourself creates repeatable business analysis, which means once you build this thing, you don't have to keep doing it all the time. Your, your company can just use it, right? And getting tools put into production, that's the single most valuable way for any non-techie people to get value from your work, right? And then the, finally, the, the fifth thing on the path is building tools for your company. So once you can do kind of like these smaller repeatable analyses, now what you want to be able to do is build these bigger, more complex analyses, all right? So building tools for your company, this automates entire business processes. It cuts the IT department out completely, which will handcuff your career if you're seeking their uh, approval and seeking their um, their resources in order to be able to put things in production. That you know that's a, that's a career killer. So basically, a death sentence. Um, and being able to do this yourself, doing more with less, is what companies actually want. So that actually turns you into a leader. Okay. All right. So recap on the path. With the path, you have all the knowledge you need to complete projects by yourself. Uh, you don't need the CEO to get angry and ask you to solve problems. You don't need data engineers to do the data engineering. You don't need micro be micromanagement by a project manager. You don't need the IT department to do their jobs to get things put into production. You can do all this stuff yourself. Now, this is what I call becoming a business scientist. And when you want to, when you uh, becoming a business scientist, it follows the path. And when you, uh, when you follow this, I have a first course. You start with the first course, which is data science for business part one. All right. So here's what data science for business part one does. It gives you the foundations of data science so you can perform basic machine learning, produce high quality reports that businesses can use to generate insights, clean and work with data. Very important. Visualize data, which produce those insights. I think producing like all of those ggplots and the ggplotly plots, you learn how to do all that fun stuff. And then uh, you can do machine learning algorithm foundations. And these are all of the foundational steps that I had mentioned before for all data science and data analyst positions, okay? Uh, inside of that course, what does it look like? Well, you learn the 20 most important functions for data wrangling. 
You learn how to master ggplot2 to be able to visualize data like a pro. You learn how to work with special data types like time series, text, and categorical data. You learn how to create functions and iterate using the per library. And we saw those map functions in this tutorial. That those That's per, basically. Um, once you learn that, you can see how powerful that is. Uh, K means customer. So you do one of the most powerful analyses that I did and I started out with, making a customer segmentation with K means. You learn how to do that. You also learn how to do uh, model product prices for your company. So you learn all of the machine learning algorithms, things like XGBoost, Random Forest, Support Vector Machine, and so on. You learn all of those in this in this part. You also make two reports. Uh, the first one is customer segmentation report. And then uh, the second one is a product price prediction report. Now, what the key is, what do this, any of these courses do for you? So what does this course you know, uh, do for you? Well, here's what it did for David. He says here, I nearly doubled my salary and it's because I'm taking your courses. He got uh, accepted at Sylvan Road Capital as a data analyst with just this first course, okay? So today, guys, in this offer, you're getting Data Science for Business Part 1, a $659 value. Next, business problem solve. So we need to give you Data Science for Business Part 2, which is gonna cover business problem solve. Uh, inside of Data Science for Business Part 2, you're going to do what companies actually need you to do when you're on the job as a data scientist. You're going to solve big problems. So a $5 million per year business problem. You're going to use a repeatable framework that can be applied to almost any business problem. You're going to learn how to solve the business problem step by step. You're going to use advanced tools like automated machine learning and explainable AI. And then you're going to de develop financial decision making using return on investment analysis to show organizations how much money they're actually saving by implementing your data science project. All right. Okay. So inside of this, uh, you learn my seven stage business science problem framework. You can see all of the stages up here. And you actually, I walk you through this, this um, entire business problem solving framework. And we actually solve the problem through you know, eight different sections in, the, in this particular course. You're going to use H2O AutoML to make hundreds of machine learning models automatically. You're gonna learn how to cost the problem, which is something that you know I would say, I'd venture to say like 90% of data science teams, they completely skip this step. Uh, and they wonder why six months into the project, they're not saving their company any money. It's because there was no cost there to begin with. Um, the next thing is pair plots. This is so you can find quick wins in your data. Uh, next, you learn feature engineering. This is to make your models extremely accurate. The best features make the best models. Next, you learn how to use the H2O leaderboard to make hundreds of models very fit, very fast and to track their performance. Uh, then you learn how to select, compare and select and pick the best models. You also learn explainable AI so you can explain your models to executives. You can you learn how to optimize the model to tune the model for expected savings. You can see here that if you just go with the default values, you're not going to be maximizing your ROI. And I teach you how to tune those models to save companies even more. Then you also learn sensitivity analysis. And this is how to uh, see what the effect is on key performance indicators when your model inputs change. Okay, And then you learn how to give a recommendation to management. All right. So uh, again, what does this course do for you though? At the end of the day, that's where the buck stops. So let me introduce you to Augie. He's one of my students. He applied what he learned in this course alone and he literally saved his company $400,000 per month or $5 million per year. And he says here, you know, we process even more vehicles. So this is probably underrepresentative of the true savings. He says that this project was a huge success. I got a personal message from the CTO and the CEO just mentioned the model in our most recent investor call. And he says, the skills displayed during the project were a major consideration factor in my promotion to analytics manager a few months later. And it was all thanks to the skills I picked up in your course. All right, that's pretty good. Uh, $5 million right there. And he got a promotion out of it. So today, guys, you're getting data science for business part one, data science for business part two, a $1,718 value. Now, next on the path is time series. And for that, you're getting my high performance time series course. Now, how many of you guys have ever taken a course where you're actually learning from the guy who wrote the software. Anybody, has anybody done that? Okay. All right, a few of you have. Okay. But uh, here's the deal. 
I've created all of these time series packages here, time TK, model time, model time glue on TS for deep learning, ensemble, resampling. And what this does is it allows you to use tidy models for forecasting. Pretty, pretty fantastic. So we saw a little bit of tidy models here today. Uh, so what you do in this course is you solve a special type of problem that costs organizations millions of dollars per year. You learn strategies from four state-of-the-art time series competitions. You use the custom software that I've wrote to make forecasts at scale. We're talking thousand plus forecasts. And you're going to use advanced techniques, which is what companies need. Things like machine learning, deep learning, and feature engineering that get the most accurate results. Inside of that course, you learn the six most important time series visualizations. You learn how to summarize by time, which is a secret of the pros. You learn things like box cox transformations and, and other time series transformations. You learn how to deal with outliers and impute uh, the outliers. Uh, you learn how to, to work with x-rays. And this is one of the most important things. So when we're doing events, you know those are external regressors. And you can see here, when you add events in or external regressors, your model becomes much, much more accurate. It predicts all of those spikes. Um, you learn how to do the model time workflow, which streamlines forecasting from literally, I used to write 10,000 lines of code when I was forecasting. This gets you down to you know, maybe one or 200 lines of code. You learn how to do ARIMA, which is what I call knowing the enemy. This is your baseline model. And why do I call it the enemy? Well, it's because we want to beat the enemy. So I teach you how to use XG Boost for forecasting to beat the enemy. And then I also teach you how to improve on the enemy. So I actually combine the best of both worlds, both ARIMA for the autoregressive component and then boosting um, to get the seasonality component. So you're going to improve the enemy. You're also going to learn how to use hyperparameter tuning to stabilize your models. And this prevents you from getting in trouble. Uh, and this is something that I learned the hard way. Uh, you definitely want to have your models stabilized. Uh, otherwise, your predictions can get all wonky. So uh, I'll teach you how to do that. Another good approach is ensembles. Uh, this quote was taken from a Kaggle winner. Five bad models make one good one. That's this, That's this. Ain't that the truth? Um, that, that's how it works in time series. Uh, we also are going to teach you, I'm going to teach you deep AR, um, how to compare that to ARIMA, and then also how to use deep learning and XG Boost or machine learning together. Okay. So the key question though is, what happens when you take this course? Well, I'm going to introduce you to another student. This is Amit. Um, now, how many of you guys, uh, if you see this testimonial, you see, hey, I want to say I'm extremely grateful to have found you and your courses last year. I used to feel imposter syndrome. Now, have any of you guys ever felt imposter syndrome? Put a one in the chat if you've felt imposter syndrome before. All right. All right. Seeing some ones. I will tell you this, this was one of the single biggest things that, that held me back was constantly feeling like I'm not good enough, constantly feeling like, you know, I'm comparing myself to others, seeing what they're doing on LinkedIn and social media. And it's very frustrating to see people, you know, getting positions or doing good things or working on all this other stuff and feeling like you're not good enough. So that's, that's just, that's the environment that we live in today, whether we like it or not, but we got to break out of that. We got to solve that problem. So here's how Amit solved it. He said, I used to feel imposter syndrome when I first started working. My skills were lacking compared to others. And I always felt like I had a lot to catch up on. Now I feel like I belong and I can take on any new challenge. I would not have my new job if it wasn't for you. And I will always be thankful for that. In short, you have changed my life and the direction of my career. He's now the machine learning associate at PwC, one of the big four consulting firms. Um, he also had sent me his uh, take-home exam when he was in his interviews, uh, just you know, giving me a, a, uh, an opportunity to take a quick look at it and, um, and see if I saw anything. And he says, this helped me move into the final rounds. I was able to do everything within two days. And if it wasn't for your courses, it would have definitely taken me longer. And I don't think my results would have been half as good to move in the final rounds. So he got two big wins out of this course, solved his imposter syndrome, and he got a job. So today, guys, you're getting Data Science for Business Part 1, Data Science for Business Part 2, plus my high-performance time series course. Total value, $2,637. All right, next on the path is building tools for yourself. For that, we have Shiny Applications Part 1. And again, production is so key to your career. So what you learn here is the foundations of production for data science. You learn how to build web applications that your company can use. 
and you learn how to automate key business analysis and processes. And this is going to empower your company to make data-driven decisions for years to come. So this is the first app that I teach you how to build. And the important thing here is it's got this red line. That's the forecast. And what it does is it does something that no other software packages can do, like Tableau and Power BI. They can't make a forecast on demand. It's very difficult to do that or impossible to do that uh, in Tableau and Power BI. But in Shiny, you can do that. And this is actually what has gotten some students jobs. And I'll mention and I'll showcase uh, one of them later on. Uh, the second app that I teach you how to build is this price prediction application. So we're actually looking for gaps. What this tool does is allows people to analyze the gaps in their um, products and come up with new products based on those gaps with machine learning. It's going to actually recommend what the price should be and what the features should be for that particular model. Uh, very, very powerful. So what does this course do for you? Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Habby. This is a great testimony. She's a student of mine. And this is the first Shiny app that she literally has ever built. She made this for her data science portfolio after taking this course. And it actually got her a job or helped get her a job at the US Federal Reserve of Minneapolis. Here's something crazy though. She had never had a job before this course, like never even had a data science job, never had a job period. Fresher, completely fresh. She got a data science job at the, like literally the backbone of our financial economy, the U.S. Federal Reserve. Pretty, pretty cool, right? Um, here's Francesc. He, he made a Euro stock analyzer, which integrates uh, model time. And you can see it's doing ensembling. It's, these are your base models. This is the ensemble prediction. Uh, he came out of my program with a job offer and being able to make tools like this is what helped. So today, guys, you get data science for business part one, part two, my high performance time series course, and my Shiny Web Apps Part 1 course, $3,516 value. Last uh, is building tools for your company. So this is uh, for that, we have Shiny Apps Part 2. And inside of this course, this, you're going to learn what no other data science program teaches. Things like cloud technologies, AWS and Docker, things like scaling and deploying data science, things like adding security authentication, which is a requirement for the enterprise, things like connecting back in databases, things like customizing the user interface, integrating an API, everything you need to, to know to deploy applications into the enterprise. Uh, inside of this course, the, the amazing thing is you don't just build enterprise grade apps, but you actually deploy them using AWS te cloud technology uh, get, and GitHub for production code and Docker and Docker Hub for uh, managing the, 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 uh, the versioning in the environment. These are the exact same skills that companies literally pay senior data scientists $150,000 or more for, okay? Uh, to prove it, we've got Mohana. He is the lead data scientist at MoneyView. He says here, after your entry into my life, just another six months of 3.5% raise hikes, I got a 10% hike. And then after another six months, 26% hike. And another two months, a 40% hike. I could literally grab a job wherever I want, okay? This is a total of a 94% raise in just eight months what he achieved after he took this course. The secret, he was able to run circles around his counterparts with, with the shiny web apps in production. Doing more with less. All right, this is the type of web application that you build. Example of a shiny web app, high end. Data Science for Business Part 1 today, guys. You're getting Data Science for Business Part 2, my high performance time series course, shiny web apps 1, shiny web apps 2. And uh, I know what you're thinking. What about projects? Inside of this system, you complete eight end-to-end -end projects. That is a lot of experience. That's a lot of projects to fill your job portfolio with. You first, in, in the first course, you learn customer segmentation project. You, that's your first project. Second project, product price prediction, also in course one. Course two, $5 million churn prediction. Course three, $5 million demand forecasting project. Course four, you learn how to build a demand forecast app with on-demand forecasting. Course four, you also learn how to build that price, product price recommender app. And then in course five, you learn how to do the stock analyzer app, which is a multi-user app. And then in, also in course five, you get a bonus app. You learn how to build an application library. Why is that important? Well, it's for your job portfolio. You need an app that houses your other apps so you can quickly filter and show, um, show, show the... Uh, your interviewees, whoops, uh, your interviewees. Whoop, 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 whoop. Sorry, going the wrong way here. 
There we go. Um, so you can quickly show your interviewer what apps you've built in the past. Okay, that's pretty cool. What about lifetime support? You get access to my Slack channel. This is an old image. Here, let me show you what the uh, the Slack, good old Slack channel looks like nowadays. Um, you can see we've got 3,244 people in here and they're all on the same path as you learning data science. Why is that important? Well, when you run into errors, when you run into problems, when you need help, you've got that support, a direct line of communication to me and 3,000 3, plus other students that are on the same path as you. It's pretty fantastic. All right. Um, next, what results can I get? Here's what happens when you join the path. This is what happened with David. Got a job at Microsoft. Says your courses gave me the confidence to get through the interview process. Justin says, in less than six months, I had fully transitioned into a lead data scientist at Northwestern Mutual, Fortune 500 company in insurance. Ben Wynn Morris, after five years of struggling, I now have two job offers. Jennifer, she has got her dream job. She's the VP of strategic analytics at JP Morgan Chase. She says, thanks to Matt and what I've learned so far, I was able to do an in-depth analysis of Consumer Financial Protection Bureau data following his business science problem framework and complete the project using our markdown. The polished, finished product impressed the hiring manager so much she was willing to fast track an offer. Pretty insane. Uh, but I'm going to give you a special advantage that none of these other people had. To reward the fast action takers today, the first 10 people are, to take me up on this offer will get a free one-on-one -on -one coaching session with me. Uh, why is that important to you? Well, here's how Samantha used her one-on-one -on -one coaching call. She used it to get through the third round of the CVS Pharmacy Data Scientist interview. And you know, if you if you've never done a data science interview before, the first round is normally just to you know with a hiring manager to make sure you have a pulse. Second round is what most data scientists get nervous about, and that's because it's a technical examination. But it's actually the third round that's the toughest. That's when it's you and maybe one or two other people that are really really good. And they've decided you you are the cream of the crop. We're going to pick one of you. Well, that's where Samantha was at. Now she got a hold of me before that third inter, third round interview, and here's what happens. She says I got the job. She had her coaching session with me, and she says, and uh, the next day, happy to announce I got the job, and I truly want to thank this course and channel for motivation. So she's now the R shiny data engineer at CVS Health. So today, guys, we're getting data science for business part one. Part two, my high performance time series course, my shiny web apps one, my shiny web apps two, and then the first 10 people that take me up on this get the one-on-one -on -one coaching call with me. $1,000 value, total value, $5,395. Okay, the first 25 people will also get a special bonus called the lost time series modules. And this is really powerful because I'm giving you five recipes that are advanced recipes to that extend what you've learned in the high performance time series course. So these are the five things that all of my students that took that course, you know, they, these questions came up most frequently. The first one is how do I deal with changing demand? So I made recipe one, how to forecast with changing demand. The second one is how do I do iterative forecasting? Well, I, I uh, upgraded model time and I came up with a new lesson on how to use that. And you learn how to do iterative forecasting without for loops. Recipe three, you learn how to do autoregressive iterative forecasting with lags. And this is great for monthly and quarterly data where you may not have features that you can come build out of the timestamp. So what do we do? We use lags. And I show you how to do that in this recipe. Recipe four, we use one of my favorite algorithms, H2O automated machine learning. And you learn how to turn that into a forecaster. And then in recipe five, and this is the big one for companies like Walmart and Target and, and Kohl's and, and all sorts of retailers or any en energy companies too. They all need to do hierarchical forecasting. So when you have intermittent demand, how do you forecast with those? Well, you get that secret in this one. But the key is, what again, what does this do for you? Meet Jeanette. She says here, uh, she interviewed at the Bank of Canada. And that's kind of like the Federal Reserve, but for, for Canada. Uh, and she says, I want you to know that I got a job offer in the government from Bank of Canada as a data scientist. I applied for the position concerning a certain level, but the surprise was when they saw the shiny app forecasting using model time, they created a higher position for me. Thank you, Matt, would not have been possible without your courses. The whole team uses Python, but what did set me apart was that shiny app. So she crushed it. I've never heard of this before. She actually got promoted inside of the interview and she says they created a higher position for her. So she not only got the job, she got a higher position 
just because she was able to showcase her skills with Shiny and do something that the rest of the team who were Python programmers could not do, build apps production, all right? So again, guys, today you're getting data science for business part one, part two, my high performance time series course, Shiny Web Apps 1, Shiny Web Apps 2, one-on-one -on -one coaching call, first 10 people, first 25 people are getting the last time series modules, total value $5,894. Now, the first 25 people will get a new bonus called ChatGPT for data scientists. And this is amazing. What ChatGPT, and obviously you guys know the world is, is changing. We have two different modules. The first module cuts is uh, teaches you how to avoid the mistakes. So the first three months that I was using ChatGPT, the things that I got tripped up off of. Uh, the second one though, which is really powerful, shows you how to build shiny web apps, the things that you learned in uh, part one and part two, um, how, to, how to do them 10 times faster with ChatGPT. So again, guys, you get the first course. This is the one that'll um, help you avoid those initial beginner mistakes with ChatGPT. And then the second one, which is how you really get screaming productivity when you're building your shiny web apps. You, you build this pharmacy finder in here and it's, it's insane. So today, guys, you're getting Data Science for Business Part 1, Part 2, my higher performance time series score, Shiny Web Apps 1, Shiny Web Apps 2. First 10 people get a one-on-one -on -one coaching call with me. The first 25 people get Lost Time Series module. And the first 25 people get my new chat GPT for data scientists package. All right. Total value, $6,393. Now, if you were to buy it from my website, it would really add up to $6,393. But listen, I get it. I understand that's a lot of money for some people, even though it's worth every penny because it's going to help you get your data science job. So instead of paying $6,393, I'm going to give you guys all a massive discount today, 66%. All right. So today, guys, you're getting data science for business part one, part two, my high performance time series course, shiny web apps one, shiny web apps two. First 10 people are getting my one on one co coaching call with me, personal co coaching call. $1,000 value there, the lost time series modules in ChatGPT for data scientists. Instead of paying $6,393, you're getting it for 66% off. That's yours today for only $19.99. Now, last time I announced a sale like this, sold out on the first day. Uh, so for those of you who want to become a business scientist, I have a question for you. Are you ready to change your life? Because ready on three, Two, one, let's go. All right, I'm going to put the link in the chat, guys. Here, I've got it over here. Let me pop it right in here. Um, and then I will begin taking questions here in just a second. All right, so I just put the link in the chat. While you guys are getting signed up, um, I do, I, I have 30 minutes on the clock. What we'll do is we'll do some Q&A here. But uh, for those of you who are interested in this package, who are ready to change your life and become a business scientist, I'm super excited for you. <laughs> Um, what we're going to do, I'm going to walk you through this thing. All right. And I'm going to show you what the checkout page looks like, um, and how this works. So, like I said before, this is the 2023 data science career deal. The offer goes away in two days. Um, there, uh, like I had said, you're getting the five course art track special, all five courses bonus one, you're getting the new, uh, lost time series modules, those five recipes, and bonus number two, you're getting the ChatGPT for data scientists that comes with two modules on how to use ChatGPT um, and how to build a, sh a shiny app with ChatGPT. Uh, and then also you're getting that one-on-one -on -one career coaching call. Again, limit that's limited to uh, 25 people for these, these two items, limited to 10 people for bonus number three. Total value, $6,393. Here's the order form. It's right here at the bottom of this screen. Uh, you can see you're going to enter your full name. So that's your first and last name. Uh, and your email address. What that's going to do is it's going to link you up to our platform. I'm going to show you guys what the platform looks like in, in just a second. Um, you're going to enter your, your phone number, and that's in case we ever run into any problems. Uh, we can get you on the phone. We can get those problems um, fixed. Uh, there's two different payment options. Like I said, uh, I had mentioned already the 1999, that's the first payment option. Uh, again, you're getting the three bonuses and you're getting a special discount on the five course R track. The second uh, option is a payment plan, and this is for 12 payments. Uh, again, you're going to get this uh, at, a, at a, a significant discount from what you can buy. You will also get all the bonuses, uh, but here's the kicker. Um, it's going to, there's going to be two extra payments. So you're going to uh, pay 12 payments as opposed to this is the equivalent of 10 payments. All right. So uh, the single payment plan 
if you quit, if you want the payment plan, um, the 12 month payment plan, you just click this and you'll see the order form updates automatically. Um, the next thing you do, just enter your information in here. Uh, you, you click the complete the order button. And as soon as you click that, what it's gonna do is uh, Stripe will process the order and our servers will run. And what it'll do is it'll send you a welcome email. Uh, it will uh, welcome you to the course, give you the next steps. Uh, and what it's gonna do is it's gonna give you access to our platform. So I'm just gonna show you what the platform looks like. Um, so what you end up getting access to is this course, this course, this course, this course, and then you'll get again, the, the chat GPT, you'll get that course, you'll get the uh, time series, the lost time series modules course, and what else? Oh, the only thing that you won't see is the coaching session, but you will get a, an email now. We have it set up to give you an email if you're one of the first 10. Uh, it will give you an automated uh, an email that you can click to schedule your coaching session with me. Um, so that's how the program works. Uh, again, the link is in the chat. Um, the uh, Let's see real quick. Uh, what I want to do with you guys is quick, uh, just briefly mention what the structure is of the course too. So this is the first course. Um, I wanna show you guys what the course looks like inside uh, for those of you guys who might be interested in seeing that before you make the purchase. Uh, this is what the, I mean, you can see here, it's a ton, absolute ton of content. And the reason we do this is, is while the course is super streamlined, what we do is we go really into depth into what's called the 80-20 tools. And each one of these videos, so there's like 300 of them in the first course, each of them are, you can see like three minutes, three minutes, five minutes. Uh, this one's 11 minutes. That's a little bit on the longer end. We try to, I try to keep them uh, all around five minutes or so. And what that does is it makes them really easy to digest. And also you learn a lot more uh, and you take away a lot more. Um, how many of you ever, you know, taken a course where it's like, you know, one hour, you're just watching a video for the entire hour. Uh, it's a lot easier to remember the first, you know, what, what goes on in the, in that program. Um, you can see what one of these courses looks like or one of these videos looks like. I'll just click on this one. Uh, as you can see, you get a full video in here. I do what's called line by line coding. So you can see, uh, here, let me show you. I'm actually typing out with you and you're going to follow along with me. And it makes it really easy to get that mu muscle memory. Okay. We've got stuff that pops up on each of these. We're actually explaining the key concepts and it just makes it for a really good learning experience. So that's what the, the course looks like. Again, that's what every video in the system looks like. You get challenges in here to test your skills. Um, module four, data visualization. You got tons and tons, like even advanced things like advanced business plotting. And that's just in the first course. So each one of these courses is structured the same way. That was uh, data science for business part one that we were looking at. Um, if you go to say like the high performance time series, uh, same situation, it, it's, they're virtually identical. We keep it super consistent, lots of short videos to really get you up and running fast. So again, you know, lots of short, like four minute videos. We're going through the Kaggle competition review, the forecasting review, um, the project setup and, and everything. So you can see tons and 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 tons, and tons, and tons, and tons, and tons uh, lots of content. All right. So that's what this looks like. Put the link in the chat one more time. And um, now I'm uh, ready to handle any of your questions. So any of you guys that are interested uh, in the, either the program uh, or have any questions, I'm happy to answer them on this call. So I'm going to go through the chat uh, now and let's see what questions we have in here. Okay. So. Please put your questions in the chat. What what questions do you have uh, right now? I'm not seeing a, a ton of questions. Maybe they're in the Q&A. Uh, Bethany says, I thought that there was a geospatial component to your series. I did not see that in there. Was I wrong? Okay. So the geospatial, that'll be handled under what's called Learning Labs Pro. Let me, uh, let me go back here. Uh, so if we go, oops, back, back, one more time, back. Uh, maybe it's this one. Yeah, go back here. I want to show you what Learning Labs Pro looks like. So Learning Labs Pro is a, a separate program and that contains 80 plus labs. Uh, we got 87 in here right now. Uh, we got time, we got extra time series. We got AI, we got chat GPT. We got, ah, here's geospatial. So this is the geospatial component. Okay. 
Um, so you'll need to sign up for Learning Labs Pro if you want this content, uh, and you can do so on my business science website. Okay. All right. Uh, Good question. Geospatial is covered in Learning Labs Pro, and Learning Labs Pro enhance this, enhances this core offer. So if you if you want Learning Labs Pro, uh, the first step though is you got to get the skills, get the job, and that's that's what's in this program. Okay. All right. Sebastian says, could we see the files that you showed us today? Yeah, I just showed them to you. Uh, they were uh, in the tutorial. If you weren't taking notes, though, uh, you got to you got to uh, sign up to to get access to it. Okay, uh, Funda asks, Matt, can we please send the Python version of the link? Um, so Funda, I apologize, but this offer is exclusive to our users and people who wanna learn R. So if uh, you're interested in Python, the presentation today was not for you. Um, so I apologize about that, but um, any Python users, you can quietly exit the, uh, the conversation now. Um, let's see. Andreas, is today's lab over? Yes, we're well. We're we're in the Q and A session. It started uh, at two p.m. Eastern. Uh, so I apologize if you missed it. Fizz Orange, uh, I'm so excited to watch the the recording. A work meeting took me away from most of the session. Oh, that's that's a bummer. Um, let's see. Okay, what other questions do you guys have about any of the content that you guys saw today? Uh, I guess we have the Q and A as well. Yeah, put put a put a comment in the chat if you're interested in uh in, in what in what you need to uh to hear about the um the uh the information that you saw today. Okay, so we got a question about the cheat sheet. We will we will get you the cheat sheet as soon as uh the QA session is completed. Uh how would you calculate the effect of the price change? Um, so the effect of a price change would be just running your machine learning model. Okay. Here, I'm going to put the link in, link in the chat one more time. Okay. Remember those 10 coaching ses sessions will go quickly. So if you're interested in getting a coaching session, uh, definitely sign up, uh, ASAP because those are, those are going to go first. Okay, a uh, question for you guys. Anybody who's on the fence with learning data science uh, for your career, uh, what questions do you have on the program or what questions do you have uh, that could that are keeping you on the fence and what doubts do you have? Uh, put them in the chat for me. Okay. All right. Elda says, signed up. Thank you. Awesome. Looks like you're getting a coaching call. Woo. Excellent. All right. So we got Elda who's signed up. We got one, two, three. All right, looks like there's six more spots left. So for those of you who are interested in the coaching call, I wanna make sure that you get attention first. Uh, what questions do you guys have? Uh, what question do you have specifically if you're interested in getting the coaching call? Put that in the chat. Okay. All right, so while we're waiting for, for those people who are on the fence, what uh, Flavia asks, what should you do when the predictions black dots are much higher than the smooth lines? So this is where it becomes more of an art than a science. And you need to understand that there's gonna be situations where some of those black dots might be higher. So what I would do is I always go back to the data. Why is that? thing that machine learning model predicting that and that's what we, we call explainable ai so you can actually use explainable ai which is what i teach in data science for business part two to understand which features are causing that black dot to be higher or lower okay and a lot of times um 
it's going to be something. So you need to understand what that feature is. And, uh, and then you as the data scientist need to decide whether or not you should select that price or if you, or if you should go with the smooth line. Does that make sense? The, uh, that was Flavi, Flavi von Rickenbach. Does that make sense? All right, good, 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 good. All right. Elda says, I'm working on a very interesting problem, but the uh, depth var is binary. Uh, it's where they sign up or don't sign up. I love to adapt what I learned today uh, to limited dependent variables. Yeah, the uh, Elda, awesome decision. This program is literally top of the line. It's going to help you so much in every single uh, facet of what you do. You're going to become more efficient just with the first course. More efficient. You're going to get the uh, foundational skills down. With the second course, that's where we start to take, you know, really take you to another level. You get the more advanced business problem solving and advanced machine learning, the, the high performance time series. These are things that really helped me in my career specifically. And that's why I included them in this complete package. Uh, and then the shiny web apps too. So I can't say this enough and I'm not sure what you do, Elda, but um, what I was doing in my career was actually building web applications that uh, like automated the business processes. And uh, one with, with one of those business automations, we were able to save the company $15 million just by like focusing on and doing lead scoring. So that was pretty impressive. Uh, I ended up getting like um, promoted three times uh, within the span of two years. Uh, and I went from managing five people to about 60 people. It was insane uh, just by the stuff that, I, that I'm teaching you in here. I also, and I don't know if you're interested or any of you guys are interested in consulting, but these are this it's the same stuff. So once I started building some of these web applications, I started actually like um, showing the web apps online. And, uh, and a crazy thing happened. I started to get consulting requests from them. So uh, I remember I was going to the uh, our finance, uh, I think it was back in 2018 or 20, yeah, one of the one uh, uh, several years ago now, but I literally posted a video of one of the apps that I that I was getting ready to present at the our finance. Uh, and I and I ended up getting consulting gig just from that. So it was pretty powerful. Um, and all of this stuff, I mean, it's going to help you in your career, whether you want to, you know, get a better job, get a promotion, or if you want to even branch out and start to do freelancing and consulting, it'll help you with that too. So um, I'll put the link in the chat one more time, and then I'll handle uh, some of these, some of these more, uh, some of these questions. Here, hold on one second. Let me put the link in the chat one more time. Okay. How would you approach a symbol, similar problem today uh, with products across different product categories? Ooh, uh, lots of product categories and sold in dozens of markets. So I would use the same framework. Um, now, I would try it with and without different markets to see if there is an effect of markets. Um, the key is, is, is you don't want to include unnecessary features, but if you can group things together, like certain markets behave similarly, or um, you can add that as another feature um, and do your machine learning model that way. Um, but I'm a big fan now of applying machine learning and adding more and more columns to our data set in order to be able to really fine tune and understand um, how that pricing model works. Uh, and we can do that. So like I showed today uh, in the code here, uh, where we had the event here, you would just add another column with your markets. You would add other columns for you know your product categories. So you've got product here. You, you do like product category as another column, and you'd be able to, to follow the exact same framework and process. Okay. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Does that make sense, uh, Milos? That was you. Okay. Good. 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 All right. Uh, let's see. Next question. I'll put the link in the chat. Is there any other questions for people who are interested in? The program. Um, I want to make sure I get you guys uh, handled before we wrap it up here. Okay. All right. Um, so if you have any questions, if you're on the fence with this offer, this uh, again, it's a game changing offer. 
you will get uh, access to much more significantly more content than what's available on my website. And you'll get the one-on-one -on -one coaching call, um, which I'm excited for because that thing um, helps out a lot of people. Uh, I've done over, I think, 80 of these one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching calls. And it's just people, are, it's game changing for people. Um, all right. I'm going to go through a few more questions in your, uh, Stephen asks in your original data set, what was each dot in the scatter plot? Different time periods. Yeah. So what that would be is like a different day. So, uh, you know, uh, a company that sells on Amazon, we'll say. So Amazon iPhone case. All right. So uh, if we just go to best protective cases, let's just check this out real quick. So this company has uh, 9,800 reviews. They're probably selling thousands per day. Um, a lot of times you can see uh, cell phones and accessories. You can see how many um, how many they sold the past month. Uh, there, let's see, iPhone case, cell phone and accessory, iPhone case. So let's see here. Uh, that's sponsored. We want to go to one that's not sponsored. Yeah, usually it'll tell you um, how many it's it's sold in the past month. Maybe it's only on like the my app. But anyways, the um, basically what you can do is you like when you sell these things on Amazon, you're able to change your prices. You're able to do like different stuff with that and you can do tests and uh each one of those dots would be for a different day so say one day your company sold you know a couple thousand of these to like all their different different distributors like walmart amazon whatever um you know that would be like sixteen thousand units per day that that company sold or it might be a thousand units per day that um, i believe is what they sold and then it was like sixteen thousand dollars so a lot of these companies up here you'd be surprised at how many of these how many units that they sell on amazon per day um, so that, that's what each of those dots were. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Good, 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 good. All right. Um, next question. Uh, Subam asks, hey, I uh, could only join really late. Will the recording be available in the recorded format to watch once it ends, at least for a day? Uh, I will send out the recording, but it's going to be, um, it's only going to be available, I think, until the deal is, is the offer expires. So when the offer expires, um, the, the the video goes away, all right? Okay, I'm gonna put the link in the chat one more time. What other questions, anybody on the fence, uh, on the fence with learning uh, R or data science, what questions do you have? Do I offer a comprehensive pro program for Python? I do, uh, but unfortunately, that's not this this offer. Um, the R package is what's available today, Stephen. Uh, Sam, we'll do the R cheat sheet once uh, the timer goes up. We still got a few more minutes of um, Q and A. All right, uh, Kunal asks. I was waiting to see the price, the elasticity coefficient for each group. For example, if an iPhone 15, so you're, uh, Kunal, you're, you're looking at it like it's a linear regression where there's a line or a slope, okay? That elasticity coefficient only exists in, like if it's a straight line and if you have prices that are non-linear, like the demand is non-linear, like we showed here, Let me let me show you. So for the prices, uh, let's see the prices. Let me let me do, yeah, like this, like the squiggly line here. Like your coefficient right here is is actually going up, but then it goes back down. You see what I'm saying? It's not just a, like I could draw a straight line through it, but that's not how this works. Does that make sense? It's like these are curves. It's nonlinear demand. Um, and then let's see, like for the yeah for for this. So you could draw a straight line through this, but it's actually curved. It's actually curved here. And right here is kind of like your, your optimum. It ends up happening over here or some, somewhere in this region. Okay.
All right. So that, that's how it works. Elasticity depends on prices. Yeah. Oh, I, I think, yeah. So, you know, set the linear, the linear regression aside. We can get a coefficient for that, but there is not just like a simple coefficient when it's a nonlinear problem. Okay. Yeah, Shubham says my my organization does log log linear model for price elasticity. Is XGB better than that? That's what I found, and that's what I'm showing you in this training. Is that the machine learning component of it? I think is better. I think it's better suited for a lot of complex problems, especially when you have lots and lots of data. Um, so it can help you. You don't number one. You don't need to do the log transformations because it's log. It's linear. It's nonlinear already, um, and then you can do. Cool things like we did with smoothing out the prices. Um, that's what that's what we showed here to find the revenue, the maximum revenue. Um, so this is the revenue predicted, and you can see where the maximum occurs. You can also see the range here, like the, the best and worst case, um, which is pretty cool. That's pretty powerful. All right. So um, any other questions uh, related to the program or any of the content that you saw in here, I want to make sure I get your questions answered. I'm going to put the link in the chat one more time. Uh, remember, there's only a few seats left here. Uh, looks like there's six seats. There, there's six, there's only six seats left and those will go. So if you want the um, the coaching call, uh, then, then certainly sign up for that. Uh, Subam, yes, it was a low S curve, uh, not not low S L O W E S S. It was low S L O E S S. They're different algorithms, the, and it's in the stats package. Uh, Sam asks, beginning to dust the cobwebs. Do you recommend starting with supervised or unsupervised? Well, uh, what I recommend doing is certainly getting your foundations straightened out first with data wrangling, uh, cleaning data, working with, you know, working with um, the special data types. Those are the basic things you need to start with first. All right. That's, and then, and then the machine learning, you know, learning some of the, how to apply some of the machine learning algorithms like XGBoost, uh, linear regression, elastic net, support vector machine, um, you know, all, all of those uh, random forests, uh, decision tree and so on. You want to learn how to, to uh, use and apply those. And then what you need to do is start solving business problems. So that's kind of the way this program set up, um, Sam. Uh, honestly, you know, that, what you're asking here, are supervised and unsupervised, those are both actually covered in this first program. Uh, but then it's really where you get powerful is when you start to solve the business problems, you know, solving like a $5 million business problem for your company that's going to help them. It's going to help them significantly. That's going to get you moving forward. Uh, same thing with the forecasting and then doing the production. So that's what the system's designed for. Um, it might be a good fit for you if you're, even if you're just looking to do dust off the cobwebs, um, I would suggest even just this first course is going to get you straightened out and it'll help you do it a lot faster than, uh, than learn it on your own. Okay. All right. Uh, Sub Subam asks, what could be the reason behind a parabolic demand curve? This is not a demand curve here. If you're talking about these, this, this is the revenue curve. So your revenue gets maximized. Your demand curve is this one. Uh, here, this, this is your demand curve. So let's do this. Yeah, your demand's going to go down over time but the key is we don't really actually care about demand what we care about is maximizing revenue all right and your revenue is going to have a usually it'll have like a a peak um where you're like for this one at 60 at 55 dollars or so that's kind of where your model starts to peak and and then it starts to go back down um this one what this tells me for the business is that they can continue increasing prices beyond $30 or $35. And you're probably going to be able to maximize revenue. Revenue is not actually maximized yet. 
Uh, for this one, we can see revenue maximizes right around the $18 price range, 18 to 20, and then it starts to go down. Uh, and here we can see revenue is kind of flat. Um, so really doesn't matter uh, too much on prices. Your uh, your revenue probably around like the $50 price tag is, is where you maximize it, but it's pretty, um, we'll, we'll say it doesn't, doesn't change that much. Okay. All right. Does that does that answer your question? All right. Yeah, just hang tight. I, I said there's 30 minutes for the cheat sheet, so uh, you gotta you guys gotta chill out. Um, we're still answering some questions here, and I, we gotta respect people who are on the call who actually want information um, and want their questions answered. So please, please do me a favor and respect them. Uh, Flavia asks, uh, do you use training or test data to create the conformal predictions? So the conformal predictions, um, those are using test data. And that's important because when you make, uh, when you actually predict a, a true um, confidence interval, you wanna use out of sample data. You don't wanna use in sample data like linear regression does. Uh, so you wanna use conformal predictions. And what I showed you with the probably package, it handles a lot of that stuff for you. So it's it's pretty it's pretty uh, slick. Uh, Alex asks, how many learning lab projects are there in the Pro subscription? Um, so Pro has I think eighty seven, and this one will go in. Uh, it's eighty eight. So the last one we did was price elasticity and optimization uh, in Python, uh, and this one we're doing it in R. Now the last one we did we used Pygam. Um, we also have customer segmentation that was eighty six. Uh, and they don't necessarily go in order. So some of the, the newer labs are here are down here. So we've got lab 85, lab 73 was just upgraded uh, and so on. So if you want, you can check out Learning Labs Pro. It's on the Business Science website um, and you can check that out. Uh, Sam, yes, 80-20 split was used for the training testing groups. Yes. And that's because we want to train on, you know, four fifths of the data and we want to test on a randomly sampled 20% um, or one fifth of the, of the data. Okay. All right. So we got 25 seconds left. Um, I'm going to throw the, the link in the chat one more time. If there's any questions, speak now or forever hold your peace. All right. Any other questions? Subam. Yes. The XG boost won't give us an elasticity co coefficient, but it, it gives you something better. It gives you the actual you know, points, the, the actual prices. Um, and then what you can do is you can smooth them, you know, with a low S smoother, and that'll help you figure out where the optimal pricing strategy is. So, you know, the coefficient, set that aside. It's not super important. You know, I increase up my price $1, it goes down $2. No, it follows a curve. It follows a curve. Uh, and, and that's how we really need to think about this. Okay. So, all right, we're out of time. Uh, link is in the in the chat. Um, oh, we did get one question from Viv. Uh, what is the structure of the coaching call sessions? So the way the coaching call works is uh, normally it's a, it's a 60 minute session. Uh, the first 30 minutes, what I do is uh, I ask you a lot of questions. I figure out what's going on, how I can help you. Um, and I ask you a lot of questions about the problem that you're facing, whether it's in an interview or if it's a data science problem or, you know, something for your company or whatever. Uh, the first 30 minutes is a lot of me asking questions. Then the second 30 minutes is where I figure out a game plan and we actually solve that problem together. Uh, we come up with a, what, what's called a strategy map. And this is where we map out specifically what you need to do in order to be able to get, you know, whatever the result is that you're looking for. So if you're trying to get a job, what you need to do, uh, like, and say you're in the third round, what you need to do to stand out, because that's the biggest thing that you need to do. You, you have now been selected as competent, but now what you need to do is stand out from your competition. So I teach you strategies on how to do that. And, and I give you a game plan for that. Um, does that make sense, Viv? That's really the structure of the coaching calls. Again, you can use them for every, anything that you want, but a lot of my students are using them for interview prep and getting, you know, getting things in line. So that way, uh, they can land a job. All right, you got it. 
the link is in the chat. If you want a coaching session, uh, they will go. Uh, Alex asks, is this two hours in the same day or do you need some time to think after asking a question? No, it's it's a 60 minute call. Uh, it's all, It all happens in the same call. So the first 30 minutes of that call is used to um, assess the situation and understand uh, a little bit about you. And then the second 30 minutes is to solve the problem. So one hour and it's highly effective. Does that make sense, Alex? All right, you got it. All right, the link is in the chat, guys. Those will go fast. Um, now what I'm going to do is uh, make sure make sure to uh, check it out if you guys want that, that coaching session because after the 10 hits, you don't get a coaching session. All right. Um, last thing, the cheat sheet. So I'm going to throw the cheat sheet in the link here or in the, uh, in the chat. And here is what the cheat sheet looks like. Just put the link in there. Let's click this, download it. And here is the cheat sheet. So this is what you guys, what the link is that I just put in the chat. It contains this cheat sheet. So it's actually, it's pretty cool. It's three pages. Uh, again, I put a lot of effort into building this thing uh, and I keep, I keep upgrading it. I think we're on version yeah, 5.1 right now. Um, each one of these links links to uh, the documentation for a package. So what it's really good for is knowing which packages to use and when. So like GG, this is the 80-20 tools, you know, the, the top tools that I recommend uh, learning and using for, you know, 80% plus of your work. Uh, then the next page is the shiny verse. These are the tools there. And then the third page is really powerful. Um, that is the special topics. So this is for things like time series, exploratory, financial analysis, text, network analysis. When you want to work in these fields, these are the packages that I recommend. Uh, and if you see a CS anywhere, so if you see these CSs, what that does is it links to another cheat sheet as well. So it's really powerful. Um, it's a cheat sheet that links to cheat sheets, links to all the documentation. You can use it with ChatGPT to kind of instruct ChatGPT which, um, which packages to, uh, to apply for your problem. And it can often help improve results substantially. All right, there's one last question. Uh, is there an optimizer we can use on top of low S? Uh, I don't really know what you mean on uh, in terms of optimizer. Normally what you're gonna do is you're gonna look for where the maximum occurs. And that's what we showed here uh, is the, these are all of the maximums. So this is what you would give to your business. Um, like you'd export this as a CSV and say, hey, at this price, this is optimized. Uh, we can expect, you know, XG boost is predicting 27,000. The smooth XG boost is 25,000 uh, per day uh, at $40 on Black Friday. Okay. Um, on the no promotion, it's this. So we're looking for where does that peak happen? Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, so premium case, iPhone 15 Pro. Uh, so that's premium case, iPhone 15 Pro. That's this one. And this is the no promo happens at a price of $54 and or $54 and 60 cents. So that's right here, which is like right, uh, right here in this range right here. Okay. That's where the optimal price occurs. And you see how that smoother, that smoother is picking that out, right? Okay. XG boost predicts $15,000, but that smoother, which is a smooth value is going to be a little bit higher than that. Okay. You, you could do the max uh, XG boost, but uh, you know, it just it just depends what you want to go with. Okay. All right, that's a wrap, guys. Um, until next time, we will have another uh, learning lab in another couple of weeks, um, and uh, I can't wait. So I will see you again soon. All right, see you, everybody. Bye.